Hi, and good afternoon, or good morning, I guess, to wherever you're joining us from. Uh, I'm James Hill. I'm Mindy Bonine. And we're here for week four at the Headwaters Excavation Project. And uh, today, just kind of wanted to give you guys a brief update real quick. Today we're in the formerly underwater Block C for the afternoon. And as you can see, we've actually been able to kind of clean up a little bit in here get working and open up some more units. And uh, actually, uh, kind of just right off, hot off the press, I wanted to show you guys a very interesting, what we're gonna call a drill that just, just popped out here by uh, Emily, our Texas State graduate student who's out here volunteering with us. So it's kind of cool. Looks like it's a Petronalis point that's been resharpened into a drill. You can kind of see the elongation right here. It's very unusual for us to find drills without their tips broken off. So this is really exciting find for us. Yeah, usually, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're usually broken and we're pretty lucky to find that. But anyway, mm -hmm. so just jumping right in. Um, this feature right here, we have a, uh, what we're gonna call a... Another hearth feature. Yeah, a single use yeah. hearth feature. And uh, it's, uh, what's pretty cool about this, here I'll show you guys. Mm -hmm. To another really cool projectile point and kind of came right here kind of actually we found when we were excavating this out we found the tips the tops of these rocks here and then we found that projectile point right smack in the middle of the hearth feature so just sitting right on the top and that was a pretty exciting find for us um, and then we kind of uh, dug out a little bit further around. We found all, this, all these additional rocks. They're in a really, really nice tight cluster. And the other feature that we look for, especially for these single use hearths, is the fact that these rocks are cracked in place, which means that they got hot, but they didn't move. And they form these sort of crack lines. When you see these midden features that these giant piles of burned rock, basically it's these that have been all split up into parts. But these are the rocks in their original form and they are cracked in place. And that's how we know that they ha hasn't been moved uh, since it was used. Yeah, so so pretty pretty cool with this feature um, and, and kind of, uh, we've, we've removed a couple others in this area here, similar to this to this this guy. Yeah, but not as nice. This yeah. one's actually really quite, uh, it's a really nice, very sort of contained hard feature. The other really great thing about this feature is that we're not only finding the rocks, but we're also finding lithic material here. This is a piece of mussel shell. Uh, there's some rhabdotus uh, snail shells that are nestled in here as well. And we also found this little section right here. You can kind of see the change in the color. So that's a little piece of sort of burned soil um, that we're gonna collect and, and uh, uh, sort of test in our lab to find out you know, so as much information as we can about that. There's another uh, mussel shell here as well. So, um, so we're finding all these things together, and when we're finding them together, we know that they're they're related to each other. They're connected. Yeah, and a block C gives us a a, a, di a much different, or a, I'm sorry, a, a unique uh, perspective for the site because unlike the other two blocks that we focused on, kind of in the last couple of weeks uh, before the holiday break, in, in A over there and Block D that we were in uh, a couple weeks ago. Those are large burn rock midden scatters. So large, large, dense concentrations of burn rock that have just kind of accumulated accumulated over years and years and years. Where this guy is probably a single use, single, uh, single use kind of hearth feature or a clean out of a hearth feature. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, in a way, it, it gives you like an encapsulated, uh, very uh, small window in time, whereas the burn rock middens are much bigger, much larger. You get to look mm -hmm. at stuff over a much longer period of time. This is kind of a snapshot into, you know, a single use event, which which gives us a lot of different yeah. data. Right. We can compare this with what we're finding in the midden features and be able to find out sort of what the process of the cooking is. So, so. But yeah. Um, okay. And um, today we have a special guest. Um, so um, we are... Uh, sort of going to explain a little bit today is our little special segment uh, a little, little bit about all of these stone tools that we've been talking about and over here is Chris Ringstaff and uh, he's a flint he's an archaeologist and a flint napper and we'll explain what that means in just a minute 
Um, and we're going to go over and sort of talk to him. He's going to show us how all these stone tools are being made. So why don't you come with me? Yeah, guys, real quick, I wanted to jump in. Uh, Chris is a expert in lithic tool technology, and I would welcome all of you to please ask us some questions. Maybe uh, ask Chris some questions because he, he's happy to ask, mm -hmm. answer. Yep, all you have to do is just type it in and we'll get the message. So why don't you come with us and we'll head over here. Chris has set up a little station uh, to do some uh, sort of napping uh, explanation. You. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> um, we are, so one of the, let me uh, sort of start by sort of reintroducing some of the stone tools that we've kind of profiled in the very first video that we made. Uh, the, these are tools that we found at this site um, uh, at various stages of the const of, uh, construction that was going on here. But as you can see, there's kind of like, they look all, they look pretty different. There's, you know, this big job right here, all the way, all the way down to these very, very delicate arrow points right here. And all of this stuff is made from the same type of material, which we call chert. Um, uh, usually in uh, uh, abroad, they call it flint. Uh, is another name for it, but we call it chert here. Um, and uh, it's all made from the same type of material. Um, and it's an, that is an excellent material to be able to make these stone tools with. Um, so basically, we're going to discuss how these tools have been made, uh, what they're going to be, what they would be used for, um, and why we're interested in studying them so much. So let's move on to uh, to Chris. Um, so do you want to start with the flint and process? Yeah. So yeah. let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Ringstaff. Yeah. I'm an experimental archaeologist. So um, what I want to talk to you all about today is um, stone tool technology and, and why, as an experimental archaeologist, I use um, flint napping to help me better understand what I see uh, in the archaeological record in terms of the stone tools. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you through the whole process on how stone tools are made and the kind of debris and things that get left behind. So. As Mindy mentioned earlier, there's a lot of chert around here uh, that comes out of the Edwards limestone. So this would be really good examples of that particular kind of chert. So what happens is the prehistoric hunter gathers, they'll look at a piece, and they'll grab a tool called, well, a hammer stone. And there you go. And then they'll, they'll kind of knock on it and shape it a little bit. There you go. So as you can see, now one disclaimer I would like to, to make here is for, for those kids, don't try this at home. As you can see, I'm wearing you know safety glasses and, and this is very dangerous. I've already bled once today, so uh, I, I can't emphasize enough just how how dangerous this is. I so. can tell from, I, I know from personal experience, all these tiny little shards that he's knocking off fly everywhere. And so it's just And these like edges are fly. razor sharp. Yes. And so, and it makes a lot of sense if you're a prehistoric hunter-gatherer. So what would happen, you see, you can tell already the kinds of debris that I've left behind. So these are a lot of the flakes that we might find at a location where the flint was coming out of the ground. And we'd find these large flakes with that outer cortex on there and some they would leave behind and some that they would like they thought they could make into other tools or had nice sharp edges they might keep and so these things will be removed and then they'll leave the stuff that they don't want behind so then what ends up happening is they'll take one of those flakes so such as this and they may get a couple of so they'll mix in some different tools. So let's say we want to make, um, now I won't have time. I'll tell you what, I'll make, um, I'll just start making uh, a spear point. So I won't have time to finish it, but I'll get it going. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm using a soft hammer stone and I'm gonna use some, some different tools here. There we go. And right away you'll start noticing. There we go. 
And this is a piece of whitetail deer antler. And so already you can see that the flakes that are coming off are quite a bit different than the ones that we saw over at the quarry. A little bit smaller. Some of them are going to have less of that outer cortex on them. All right. If I could butt in for just a second, sure. you'll notice that when Chris is knocking that with the hammer, he's actually looking at it from the top, and what's coming off is coming off the bottom. So he can't even see how the flake is coming off until it drops out of his hand. So, um, and but the master flint napper knows exactly how that stone is going to react when he hits it in a certain way in a certain direction. So, so you can see just from the few minutes that I've been here. Well, I've already generated probably a hundred flakes. So these are one of the most common kinds of artifacts that we find on the site. And so uh, whenever I'm working on an archeological site, uh, after the excavations are over and we bring all the materials back in, oh, they'll probably have someone like myself a lot of time go in and try to determine, well, what kinds of tools do these kinds of flakes represent? What was being made? and maybe how many pieces were being made. And what does that say about, you know, activities that were going on at the site? It's just another piece of the puzzle for us to try to figure things out. So then, all right, so they'll get that going. And then, so sometimes, and we're able to refit things back together. So here's an example of a core and where all the pieces kind of fit back together and we're able to recreate how this thing was actually taken apart. So it was struck here and that piece was removed. And then it was struck here and then that piece was removed. And then this is a good piece, a, a large flake that they could probably modify into a tool. And this would be my core. So, you know, this helps us better understand the kinds of things that, um, that we're excavating. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing at this site in particular, which uh, coming out to visit today, what I've noticed is they're finding points of different shapes and sizes. And so through time, what you see are the points, they vary in their size and shape. And um, some of these uh, size and shape differences have to do with function. Okay, and so let me lay these out and I'll explain that just real quickly. So, <clears throat> oh, you might, let's see if I can find one piece. So a piece that a person might think was maybe an arrowhead might in fact be a hafted knife. And that would be a good example of something that might be mistaken for a spear point, but it's actually hafted on a handle. And so the best way for us as archeologists to understand uh, how these tools are being used is once they're pulled out and we take them to the lab, we can look under the microscope and see different kinds of, you know, striations and use wear, you know, damage that's typical of either cutting or slicing or this kind of thing, right? So, you know, there is a little bit of science to it. Now, some of these are actually used as projectile points, right? As so, you know, they had to hunt and so here's one that's uh, actually tied on, and this would be a dart shaft, and this is actually thrown. It's a, it's, it's a spear point. Here too, here's a spear point, and you can see this one I've actually been throwing. That's one of the perks of being an experimental archaeologist. I get to play around with these things. And then, uh, and then for the smaller points, you can see that's actually an arrow point. And we doing good on time, Mason? We're doing great. All right, all right. So, so let me show you. So here's some of the systems and their completion there. So that would be, that'd be an example of a cane arrow point, a cane uh, arrow with the <clears throat> stone dart point, and the and the arrow is actually uh, glued in place, and that's modeled after uh, specimens found out of dry caves, and then. And so those will, those are a lot more recent, maybe in the past 1500 years. And then prior to that, they were using the larger 
spears that were thrown with an atlatl. And so what would happen is they could carry a bunch of these shot, four shafts around and while they were hunting, if one was damaged, uh, they could pack the damaged one in the, in the bag, put a fresh one in and they wouldn't have to return to camp. They could just keep hunting. Now, one thing that we find here on site, I'm sure, are, well, discarded and broken projectile points. So what happens, uh, you know. Often, per, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's to be expected. So when these things are, are, in the, are hafted like this, and that just means that they're put in their shafts. Mm -hmm. So what happens if they get damaged and they're no longer useful, they'll remove them, they'll throw them away, there and then that becomes part of the archaeological record. Yep. Then they'll chip another point and and they'll replace it. Mm -hmm. So this so as an experimental archaeologist, <clears throat> I'm really <clears throat> forgive me, <clears throat> looking at the whole life cycle of these tools and how that relates to what's going on in terms of, you know, human behavior at the at the site. And Given that stone is one of the most durable artifacts that we find, um, it really, uh, it's, uh, oh, <clears throat> it, it's, you know, especially in this particular area, it's, it's necessary, you know, and. One uh, of the things that we can do is extrapolate from <clears throat> the, the artifacts that we do find, the ones that are, have a high durability, like the stone points, and we can extrapolate from that to this, because all of this dissolves over time, just get, it erodes and we, we're fortunate to be able to find uh, examples of these, these types of arrows and spear uh, shafts in dry caves or situations where preservation is very high, but often, you know, very often, uh, all we have is left is this. And well, so, Chris, we, hmm? we did have a question from yeah. a viewer um, yeah. about what sort of materials they use to glue or secure those projectile. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a real good question. Um, uh, at a site that I worked on at San Marcos Springs uh, at Texas State, uh, they used uh, a material called asphaltum, which is kind of a, a natural petroleum glue. And here's an example of uh, a projectile point that still has some remnant asphaltum on it. So that's pretty cool. And you find that from time to time. It's such a durable material. It will, you know, uh, last through weathering in the elements. And there are other materials that they could have used. They could have used, um, oh, cedar sap or hide glue or any number of things. So um, there are lots of natural adhesives that they would use. And uh, very good question. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, um, be, and uh, I think we're kind of, we kind of went over the stone tools. Uh, we also went over sort of why we study them in particular. One, they're cool. Um, is one of the, I mean, being able to sort of uh, hunter gatherers, hunting and gathering is how we define their culture. Cause that's how we, you know, that's the way that we're studying them. Um, and the stone tools are a principal factor in our being able to understand their, their life ways how that what they were gathered what they were sort of what they were hunting what they were gathering how they were cooking them just basic life skills basically um, and stone tools are basically one of the principal ways for us to be able to sort of uh, study them uh, and we can get into ex you know excruciating detail as to you know what different things mean um, but uh, taken collectively that's kind of what we're trying to do sort of sort of identify their life skills. Uh, we had another question yeah. from Aaron about how long does it take to make a projectile point? Oh, that's oh. that's a really good question. <laughs> and no, no, and that and and that's one that I've I've actually studied. Um, um, I'm in the process of writing a paper about that actually. And and so uh, of course that would all depend on the type of projectile point being made. So you could imagine between these two size types here this one's going to take me a little bit longer than this one but um oh i did a study where i made uh about 40 projectile points uh over the course of about a month and and i timed myself while i was in the process of making them and and it took me a little less than an hour uh a projectile point 
And the purpose of that study was when I find piles of flaking debris like this where I know that they were making projectile points, it tells me something about how much labor is being expended. So what, what does all this chipping debris represent in terms of labor that's going on at the site? And that gives us another angle of understanding human behavior at the site. So uh, once again, that's a, a very good question, but it depends on size, but uh, for a larger one, maybe about an hour. I've got a question. Um, what about these super, super fine, um, these super, super fine arrow points that have the tiny little uh, uh, serrations. Sort of serrations on the side. <clears throat> Does that take a lot extra, a lot more time uh, to create than the, say one that doesn't have those features? Yeah. It, so yeah. those 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 pieces are very delicate, and and it requires a whole different technique. And and I probably just have enough time to talk about that. So I won't have time to to completely finish one. But rather than starting, you can imagine if you have a fine, delicate arrow point. Well. You know, you're not going to start off with a giant piece of rock like this. What you're going to do is you'll take a, a smaller core, if you remember what I called uh, this piece, and you'll probably try to knock a nice thin flake off of it, and you'll take that flake and chip it down. So let me just see real quick if I can do this, and if not, I'll use that one. So I'm going to take this and there. So. So there's a nice, what I'm gonna call a flake blank, you see? So I can take this flake, and then I'll take an antler tine, so this is just the end of the tine, and I'll start shaping it like this. And so basically, rather than striking it, I'm kind of pressure shaping this. And once again, this process, you know, will take me, you know, oh, it'd probably take me about uh, back to the one of the questions. Oh about half hour 45 minutes maybe to get this thing down to the finished product But you can see the tiny tiny flakes that come off in this process Which are a lot distinctly different than these or these or these so the different size and shapes of the flakes Tell me something about the activities that are going on and you can also see how much smaller these are if we didn't use a very fine screen to collect um, our artifacts with a lot of these, you know, might go through. Unnoticed. <laughs> yeah, unnoticed. So, um, um, <clears throat> so pressure flaking, and it's just a little bit more delicate touch, you know, to make the finer, you know, smaller pieces. Smaller pieces. And you do find that we do find a lot of manufacturing failures, you know, and I break a lot during the process, and so mm -hmm. I never feel too bad because, well, they broke them too. So. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Chris, very much. Um, let's move on to our next uh, little, uh, our third segment for our video, and we'll pass it on to Josh yeah. um, to uh, talk about sort of our Q&A. And we always ever encourage everyone to do question and answer. Thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, questions uh, while we're doing this live broadcast. It gives us something to talk about, um, and uh, uh, it's, it's particularly things that you are all interested in. Um, so let's move on to Josh, and uh, yeah. we've got some more questions. Well, thanks, guys. Like, real quick, I just wanted to kind of summarize last week, and uh, I wanted to, you know, apologize for our uh, our, our one minute and 20 seconds of silence that we, uh, <laughs> we kind of suffered through for our videos. This is kind of a new thing that we're doing um, for our outreach in public archaeology, and so there's a lot of quirks we're working out, and so from a week-to-week -week basis, we're trying to improve upon, you know, uh, our, our, our system here and so again sorry for that but it was very interesting and we wanted to say hi to the conductors out there preschool that was joining us from uh, all the way from Indiana so that was pretty cool if you guys are watching hi we appreciate that and uh, you know throughout the week as these videos stay on YouTube a lot of questions come in and we don't get a chance to get to them all but we've written down a couple uh, sort of questions that have come in and one uh, came in this week that said the burn rock middens, like refer to the two burn rock middens that we kind of showed you at A and D. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. uh, that burn rock midden had a lot of burned rocks in it. What happens to all those rocks? So I'm assuming uh, the question is kind of derived in how did they get there and why are they there? And so it, it kind of reflects in the middens at least. Uh, it, it's built up over time. So kind of um, Mason who joined us last week for a very uh, or a couple weeks ago for a very. Uh, interpretive video on uh, kind of what kind of animals are being hunted and and cooked and, and those sort of things 
those rocks would be utilized to sort of heat, uh, sort of heat the rocks, and then they would be used to cook on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, over two or three use periods, they kind of become less hot, and you got to toss them out. And so that's well, why we see them all mounted up like that. Many ways to be able to cook with rocks, which clearly we don't do anymore, but. To, um, but there's not only sort of surface rocks where you can fry things on, um, uh, you can also do earth ovens, which um, like say if you're, you know, roasting a big, you know, pig for, for, uh, uh, for a holiday season, you could actually dig a pit in the ground and be able to line that with rocks, make those rocks really hot, put in your food, stick another pile of rocks on top and uh, just let that cook simmer for a long, long time, and you cook the food inside. Um, after all of that is done, all those, uh, all that cooking is done, you have to take the rocks out to be able to get your food out, and these discard piles are where all those rocks go when they're all done. And as we showed you in the uh, hearth feature, you can see the fracturing of those limestone rocks that were in place. Well, when, as soon as you pull those rocks out of that hearth feature, they break apart. And so you'll see large rocks in these hearth features, but with these discard piles, you see tiny, tiny little rocks. That means that they're all broken and sort of discarded after what? After a meal, a meal, after meal, after meal, after meal, after meal. And we're not talking about just one season or one year. We're talking about many, 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 many years. People would come back here over and over and over again. So we're talking about decades or even centuries of uh, accumulation of those rock, burn rock piles. Um, and so only through radiocarbon dating and sort of analyzing all the stuff that we're finding in these middens can we discern how long that period of time is, but it could span very long periods of time. And that's why the piles get so big. Yeah, it's great. So, uh, well, uh, we, we, we're kind of running out of time here, but we got time for one more question. And this one uh, kind of came in and it's more for Chris. Um, and mm -hmm. the viewer wanted to know, how do you know that a piece of rock was made by a person and not just some rock that nature sort of happened or something like that? Uh, oh, that and once again, uh, a lot of real good question today. And so uh, as an experimental archeologist uh, and making and breaking a lot of my own stone tools, you know, there are very certain, you know, attributes, if you will, that I look for. You know, you'll look for you know, the, the, the flakes that are come off that are intentionally struck. And, um, and it's a process, you know, it's, that is a very good question because uh, throughout uh, archaeological history, um, there are archaeologists that haven't been so astute with understanding stone tools. do us out here anymore, but uh, I'm sure... <laughs> we'll do we our can... best to try to answer additional lithic questions yeah. as they come up. But, I mean, this, this is something that we really enjoy working with. Um, it's one of the reasons why we got into this profession in the first place, is to be able to sort of figure out how people lived a long time ago. Um, and this is, a, like I said before, a central part of uh, how sort of figuring out how people live long ago. The experimental archaeology part helps inform us as to how, how people achieved the things that we're seeing when we pull them out of the ground. Um, and, um, and we feel pretty confident that we're, we kind of done a lot of experimenting over, uh, over this, uh, a long period of time. And uh, we're pretty confident that this is, kind of, this is our understanding of how, how they did it. Um, and uh, uh, we're gonna continue to experiment. There's specialists like Chris, um, who who's sort of are really involved in the experimental archeology span part to be able to figure out, you know, how do we get the things that we're seeing when we're coming out of the ground. So thanks, I appreciate you guys joining us for uh, this little thing. We're, we're yeah. you know, we, we love doing this. We love being able to show you um, what we're working on. Um, and we have a, a Yeah, next so, week? so for next yeah. week, we're going to uh, continue the excavations out here. Uh, we're, we're hoping it doesn't rain. Yeah, yeah. no rain. <laughs> hopefully we're, no rain in the forecast, so. <laughs> we're we're going to keep working, uh, hopefully in Block C, D, throughout the rest of the site. We'll have some more updates for you uh, next week as you come out and join us. And as always, you know, uh, like, like and subscribe. Go to the Headwaters at the Komal website, and uh, you'll get to see more interpretive videos like this. And we hope to see you soon. So thank you. Thank you.